Hi, I'm Sarah Green. I'm talking today with Harvard Business School professor David Garvin. David, thanks for talking with us. It's a pleasure, Sarah. So you have made some special case studies of Google and worked with the company to really understand how they drive change. Can you tell us in a nutshell, what is the Google approach? So first, let me set up the problem. The, the challenge for Google is that it has a very engineering-driven culture, very much in the spirit of analytical reasoning, get the data, make sure the evidence is there. Much of it was, was based on a disdain or dislike of management. So the nature of the change process was, how do we convince our engineers that management matters? And what Google did was took a data-driven approach. They used the same kind of reasoning that engineers use, but they applied it to human resources rather than to product design. The approach had basically three stages, three stages which mirror the typical change process. The first one was what scholars call unfreezing, taking on the status quo, the way they actually thought in the past about management. And what the group did, the group being a, a small team within people analytics, the data-driven part of their HR function, was do rigorous analysis comparing highly rated managers with lower rated managers to see if there were definitive outcomes, differences in team satisfaction, team performance, individual turnover. Then they went out and they actually found out what is it that these managers do they did double-blind interviews, very much to the gold standard of research. And then they proved to the engineers, my goodness, management actually makes a difference. So that was step one. Step two is changing. They actually began to roll the findings into organizational practices. So they changed their feedback surveys to mirror the traits that they discovered in their research. They developed a few training programs they began to work with managers who were leading thinkers in their functions, engineering or sales or GNA. And they gradually convinced people that these things mattered, coaching, empowerment, and the like. Then the third step is often called refreezing. It's another way of saying we institutionalize the changes. And then what they did was they took these practices, built them into award systems, performance reviews, and eventually they got to the point where people became much more promotable based on these traits. So they took a culture that was resistant to management and made it much more welcoming of management. So as part of their change effort, they really relied on this small team. Uh, and I think, in, as I read in your article in HBR, the team was called Project Oxygen. What are some of the benefits and maybe the risks of, of relying on a small team to do so much of this change management work, as opposed to asking the existing managers in the organization to do it themselves? So they clearly relied on a very small set of people. The original team had only three members. And for the most part, they were high-powered statisticians, very skilled analytically, in one or two cases, actually PhDs with strong statistical backgrounds. Now, the problem or the risk with relying on a small group like that is isolation. It's very hard to sell the rest of the organization when you have a team that's working within small boundaries. To overcome that, the Project Oxygen group did tremendous outreach both during the process of gathering data and even more when they rolled out the results, they used a process which we'll call socializing the findings. They brought in leading thinkers within the company. They brought in change agents. In the engineering function, they call these folks tech advisors. They're the leading edge of thinking about how things get done at Google. And they literally made presentation after presentation after presentation using the statistical analysis and showing the people who were going to be implementing that this was, in fact, viable and credible analysis. Without that, I think the effort would have failed. And as I understand it, some of the findings from this work were pretty obvious managerial traits to anyone who has a passing familiarity with management best practices. But what is, is the benefit of deriving those answers for yourself from your own company as opposed to, say, picking up a copy of HBR and, and just sort of reading what the best management practices are? Because the eight behaviors they found, you know, as you mentioned, are 
not exactly uh, unknown to other good management thinkers. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the findings at one level are pretty much common sense. Good managers are good coaches. Good managers empower but don't micromanage. Good managers are productive and results oriented. They communicate clearly. As you said, this is very much what you'd find in a management 101 text. There are two big advantages to doing this by yourself. And that's the first is credibility. Every organization, in fact, every organization I've ever been to treats itself as unique. They always say we're different. The only way to convince them that these results will apply to them as well is to have them use their own data. So in particular, Google is very much viewing itself as a unique, distinctive organization. And in many ways it is. The only way to convince them is to use their data. Now the second advantage to actually using your own data is you can get highly granular and specific by detailing the behaviors that accompany these overarching management ideas. It doesn't tell you very much what does it mean to be a good coach. That's pretty empty. But it turns out at Google, there are relatively few people who make it up the hierarchy. It's just a very narrow organization. So the question is, how do you coach people in that environment? And a lot of the coaching involves effective lateral movement. Now that's something that's quite distinctive to Google, and they would not have found it if they had simply read an HBR article or a management text. Well, that's enormously helpful. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure, Sarah.